welcome to episode 94 of Brews Less Travel, the podcast exploring the best uncharted craft beer scenes from across the United States. I'm your host, Brian. How's it going, everybody? Happy to welcome back my co-host for this month, Ken Carano. How's it going, Ken? Good, Brian. How are you? Happy uh, happy Ted Lasso Eve for all our uh, AFC Richmond friends out there. Uh, big uh, season three free, uh, premiere tomorrow. Yes, I, uh, everybody says it's a good show. That's one of those shows I've uh, haven't haven't tapped into yet. Heard it's very good, very funny, very good. very very sad at points. Um, but, uh, can be, but um, it's a uh, it's uh, it's verse also very uplifting too. Cool, cool. Well, how's how was your weather up there in the great city of Milwaukee? The great city of Milwaukee got dumped on with a little bit of snow this past weekend, and it's kind of cold uh, today, but we're supposed to uh, warm up uh, next week. So it's uh, it's the typical March roller coaster one day to another. You just never really know. Well, uh, glad you have enough Internet up 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 north there to join us. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. We got an, our second episode here featuring the wonderful uh, historic beer city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Tonight we are featuring Gathering Place Brewing Company. Uh, it's a brewery that is founded in 2017. Their brewery is located in the River West neighborhood of Milwaukee. They also have another location in a uh, one of those Wisconsin towns that I can't. Wauwatosa. Thank you. Thank you. Call, call, call it Tosa. Most everyone does. Yeah. Uh, and we're also going to be featuring two beers from Gathering Place, their Arriva Dolce Roma uh, Italian Pilsner and their Storm and Stress uh, Schwarz beer. Excited to open those beers, excited to have two loggers tonight and excited to have our guest joining us. Please uh, welcome, uh, join us in welcoming Joe Yato, the founder of Gathering Place Brewing Company. Hi, Brian. Hi, Ken. Thanks for having me. Great to see you, Joe. Thanks for joining us. Uh, as always, let's get started with our quick sip questions here. Uh, these are fast questions. We want fast answers for these so we can get to know you fast. Ready? Let's awesome. do it. Uh, okay. Favorite non-gathering place beer? Uh, Francis Connor Dunkel. Ooh, great answer. Uh, Old Milwaukee. Miller Lite or PBR? High Life. Oh, okay. Mild card answer. <laughs> uh, favorite historical beer site, either in Milwaukee or elsewhere? Um, Pilsner or Kell. Awesome. Favorite uh, Wisconsin sports team? The Bucks. All right. And finally, have you ever seen Bigfoot, a UFO? ghost anything inexplicable paranormal uh, no mountain lion is as close as it gets <laughs> <laughs> where, where did you see a mountain lion new mexico oh, okay well uh good uh to hear, good that you live to tell the tale about <laughs> seeing the mountain lion lion um if you saw the mountain lion they say that's a pretty good sign if you don't see the mountain lion that's that's the problem um uh, but yeah thanks for the quick step questions joe you're welcome. I'm going to have a sip of my own here. Cheers. Thanks so much. Well, cheers. And let's uh, let's get into that for our first beer. Uh, what do you want to tell us about Arriva Dolce Roma? So this beer, um, we first brewed it in 2018. So kind of on the front end of things for Italian style Pilsners. And um, this recipe came from our, our head brewer spending time in Italy. And uh, as it mentions on the can, um, having a nice conversation with with a brewer outside of Florence, um, where he was brewing these styles of beer. And it's so funny, when we first started selling this beer, we'd say it's an Italian Pilsner, and people would say, oh, it's like Peroni. And then you'd have to say, well, like Peroni is a German style Pilsner that happens to be made in Italy. So no, not really. Um, so what we do with this, um, it is dry hopped. And I, I know a lot of American breweries have, have started making these styles. And some of them think that it's just a matter of dry hopping a Pilsner. Uh, that's part of it. But 
We also change the water chemistry. And so what that results in is a super flavorful beer that has a really soft palate, really soft mouthfeel. And those hops do come in at the finish. Um, but because it's a lager, it has that crisp, crisp finish to it. It's 5.2%, goes well with every kind of food. And what started as a one-off uh, quickly turned into a season, or quickly turned into a year-round beer for us. Um, and so it has been a year round since um, 2019. And uh, it doesn't hurt that the can is in those bucks colors. And um, they've, uh, they're a popular team around here. So it, we, we really enjoy it. I hope you do too. Yeah, it's, it, it is wonderful. Those hops come through uh, really well. There's like spicy, earthy aromas, herbal flavors to them and yeah they they really come around on that back end and linger a little bit but it's it's nothing like it's not bad it's it's very good for the style and good for the beer yeah i really really enjoy the mouthfeel of this of this i've been waiting all day to have this and uh and it's it, it is absolutely not disappointed yeah i uh, think you um i was at the craft brewers conference last year and there was a presentation by the brewmaster from pilsner kell and he was saying that the key to a great Pilsner is that bitterness because you want it to linger just a little bit and it leaves you wanting to take another sip. Uh, and so I, I, I get that when I drink this beer. Leaves you, leaves you wanting more. Uh, great. Yeah. This, this beer is, this beer is wonderful and, and really great that uh, we're able to be able, uh, we're able to feature it on the show tonight. Uh, so Joe, uh, your professional background is in research and public policy and nonprofits and uh, your background in brewing, uh, as you've said, came from many years of entering homebrew competitions, getting feedback and then iterating your recipes. Is it fair to say that research, like your research background played a big role in the development of Gathering Place as a brewery? Absolutely. I mean, I think that as brewing, just like anything else, the more you do it, the, the better you get. And that research background, I'm, I mean, I still have some of my home brewing sheets where there's notes in the margins and lots of different measurements. And um, I was always trying to get better. And the thing about doing competitions is you're, you're trying to make a beer that fits within these narrow style guidelines. And you can have a really good beer, but it might not do well in a competition because it doesn't fit this these narrow margins. So that that research background definitely, um, you know, it's like a left brain right brain thing. And so there's there's part of me that is creative and thinking about certain flavors that might go together. And then there's the other part of me that's like, all right, how do we measure this? How do we know if it's this batch is better than the the batch before it? Um, so it all all plays together. When did you start homebrewing? I started homebrewing in 2008 and um, started sharing it with family, friends, started doing competitions. I joined a local homebrewing group. And when I did that, I the quality of my beer improved immensely because I would bring it to these monthly meetings and I would get feedback from people who had been homebrewing for 20 years. And, and I learned new techniques and it was really, really great. Um, and then in my, at, at that time, my wife and I were living in Washington, D.C., and I entered beer into a regional competition that was sponsored by Sam Adams. And I was one of the winners uh, with a beer that was uh, a Belgian style triple with tart cherries. And uh, that is a beer that we still make to this day. And uh, it comes out once a year in uh, October. And it's our it's our best seasonal. Uh, but winning that Sam Adams competition uh, made me feel like this hobby could be something more. Um, so it, it it was a long journey and lots of steps between that day and opening the brewery. But but that's what led us down the path. Was that uh was that competition part of their like uh what's it called the the long shot series? Yeah, great question. Uh, no, so the the long shot is a national competition. Um, and a lot more competitive than the one I did. The one I did was more for the, the Mid-Atlantic. Um, 
and it was put on by uh, a local radio station and Sam Adams. Uh, but what was really cool was um, several of the brewers flew down from Boston to do the final judging. Mm. And so that felt pretty cool. great to have their expertise and, and, and pick my beer as one of the, one of the winners. That's, that's great. That, that validation from guys have been doing it and doing it successfully had me a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one thing to have your friends drinking for free in your kitchen, and it's another thing to have those guys um, tell you tell you that, hey, this is this is good. Well, you had a, you've had an opportunity to to travel quite extensively too. You've been to you know to Germany and to the Czech Republic and and um, and Belgium. How did that influence you, and how did that influence your 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 brewing? It was a giant influence um, for me. Um, I spent a year of college, my junior year, uh, studying in Germany, and Germany is so centrally located that I had the chance to go east, to go west, and really kind of explore those different brewing cultures, and um, it, it had a tremendous uh, influence. Uh, most of our styles that we make are European-inspired, I would say, with modern American twists, whether that's using local American ingredients. Uh, we have a lot of fruits and things grown here in Wisconsin we use in the beer, uh, but we do make a lot of lagers uh, as well. Um, so from an influence on the beer style to the influence on, on what the tap rooms are like, I, I really fell in love with the beer garden culture where people from all walks of life would come and they'd bring their kids, they'd be food. And, and it was more about spending time with each other than it was about um, drinking or drinking or getting drunk. And that really is part of our mission. Uh, the ethos of our brewery is we are a gathering place, um, come and spend time and socialize. And for your viewers around the country, the, the other reason for the name is that Milwaukee is the local Native American word that means gathering place by the waters. Uh, so I wanted a name that reflected our city, but I also Drawing on that experience from German beer gardens, I wanted the tap room to be a place that could bring all walks of life together. That's awesome. I, and, and it helps me segue perfectly into my next question. I've, I've previously in other interviews heard you talk a lot about the intentionality of your tap room spaces. Um, they're absolutely beautiful from the pictures that I've seen, especially the um, the brewery location, the river, the river West location. Can you talk more about the design and intention behind those spaces? Absolutely. So our, our building in River West was built in 49 as a frigid air factory. So it's got a long history of manufacturing, but instead of making refrigerators, now we make things you put in refrigerators. So it's, it's the circle <laughs> of life. It just keeps going. Um, when we moved in, it was just a big warehouse. And I have visited plenty of fantastic breweries over the years that are nothing more than a warehouse with some stainless steel. Um, but the market has changed. And when we opened up in 2017, customers, they expected more. Um, they expected more from the liquid in the glass of a new brewery, and they expected more in terms of what those spaces looked like. And we were very fortunate to share the building with a company that designed and built bars and restaurants. Uh, I did not know they were there when we moved in. And it was just the perfect timing. And, and so they, they built out our tap room and gave us the family discount, which was very helpful because breweries are very expensive. Um, but these guys are true artists and craftsmen and they're, it, the tap room features uh, a lot of um, metals, but also reclaimed wood to really create a, a softer feel, soft lighting. Um, so you're in this big open space with tall ceilings, but it feels very intimate, and that's really a credit to uh, to their work. The the word that strikes me when every time I've walked into gathering place is welcoming. It's just a, a very welcoming space for for anybody who wants to be there. Well, thank you. Yeah, is and that, that is. No, I'm sorry. sorry go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask: Is the there's there's beautiful like wood designs that really look like 
art itself is that the, the is that the taproom design company that did that or is that um an, an artist that did that it's 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 that company so that company is a collection of artists who also know how to build things and, and i realize those are two skill sets that don't always line up um so yeah there's one whole wall of the brewery that looks like um oh thank you yeah so off to the left there um there's a whole wall that looks like a giant tetris puzzle and that's three-dimensional it's made of a lot of pieces of wood layered off the wall and um yeah it's a really really dense heavy wood it's actually what they build the boardwalks out of in, in park benches in new york city um it's very very dense and heavy and um i was really worried that people would try to climb it uh so it is very very reinforced and uh <laughs> bolted screwed onto the wall um so in six years i haven't seen anyone actually try to climb it which is i'm very thankful for <laughs> give them time yeah yes, please right. no, don't let it don't let it be a bruce less traveled <laughs> listener guys <laughs> ladies gentlemen everyone at home don't please don't do that Well, that's great. Well, why don't we uh, why don't we open up our second beer? Uh, you know, tell us, you know, tell us, uh, you know, what what came, you know, what was the the thinking behind uh, the storm and stress? So, you, you, I mentioned my time in Germany, and, and you asked what my favorite beer is. If I had to pick a second one, it would have been uh, Kostritzer, which is a German black lager uh, hmm. from and and I where I was studying was maybe an hour from that brewery. So it was very plentiful and I, I enjoyed a lot of it. And I really wanted to make uh, a Schwarz beer when we opened up. Um, I really, really love this style because people see the color and they immediately think this beer is super dark, super heavy, super boozy, but it's none of those things. Um, it's a lager, so it's light on the body, light on the palate, and it has a crisp finish but you still get all those nice roasted, a little bit of coffee, a little bit of chocolate, all of which coming from the grains. And it's 5% alcohol, so it's immensely drinkable. Um, so I, I knew I wanted to make this, this style and um, we really enjoy this beer. It only comes out once a year and uh, a fair amount of it ends up at my house when it's, when it's here. Um, <laughs> and I will just point out uh, something about the can and the name. So we try to have names that have meaning to the style of beer or where that beer comes from. And so there is a kind of famous German literary movement called Sturm und Drang, uh, which translates to storm and stress. And um, our, our graphic designer did a great job with this. That lighthouse that is on the can there is a real lighthouse. Um, it's about a mile from the brewery on the bluffs that overlook Lake Michigan. So that's the, the Lake Park Lighthouse. So it, it definitely resonates with the, the local community because that's a, um, it's a landmark. Yeah, there's a, this is just a, a wonderful beer. The, the plum and, and like dark fruit aroma uh it mentions on the can a touch of citrus i, I probably would have smelled that if i didn't read it on the sit on the can right before i smelled it but mm, it's it's wonderful and that that like dark chocolate flavor that comes through and uh it's nice that there is much more room in the market now for these approachable drinkable dark lagers um it's it's just nice to see styles like this in tamave pivo and uh and other dark loggers get their get their day in the sunlight i think the perception is changing of 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 darker beers you know, like joe said i mean like you said there you know a lot of people have the impression it's going to be really heavy it's going to be you know you're going to be high abv you're not going to be able to drink it but this is you know none of those things it's incredibly drinkable and, and, and incredibly light yeah it, it really struck a nerve here or struck a chord <laughs> People liked it. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, when we we started, we were draft only and we added cans in 2019. But this was a beer that sold so well on draft because it was so different from other things in the market. And we, we make 
we make a variety of beers. Uh, we have three year-round flagships. Uh, the Rivaderti Roma, the Italian Pilsner is one of them. We also have a Kolsch and then an IPA that's made with um, Wisconsin-grown hops. But then we have probably 16 different seasonals that we put out throughout the year. And so um, when we were first getting started, I would go, I would, I still do sell the beer myself. We, we are self-distributed. So I would go into a bar and they would say, they've got 12 taps, eight of them are IPAs. They'd say, don't give me another IPA. What do you have? And it says, I would say, do you want a Kolsch? Do you want a black lager? Do you want an amber lager? Do you want a Weizenbach? Do you want a... And, and that's one way we grew quickly was because we were filling these holes. We were, we were making styles that filled holes in the tap list at some of the best restaurants and, and uh, bars in town. And then we just word of mouth, uh, things kind of grew from there. When is, uh, when, what's the availability time ring for Storm and Stress? Um, that is out from um, about January to mid to end of um, March and April, in beginning of April. So that's more of a winter beer. And then the beer that follows it is, um, it's called Special. It's a Franconian lager, so Northern Franconian lager. So it's um, it's 5.6% and uh, in between golden and amber in color. And it's a great beer for this bridge season that Ken was talking about with our weather where it can be 50 degrees one day and snowing the next. And so to have a lager that has a bit of maltiness to it, just a little bit of body and a little bit of that alcohol strength is, is perfect for that time of year. Um, and then we transition to Oracle of Hipsters, which is our dry hop lager. So we kind of move, move along from lager to lager as, as every, every two, two and a half months. Who, who is the Oracle of hip Hipsters? <laughs> Well, so, so that's a funny one. And, and the can design is really great. It's, it's got the, the triangle with the all seeing eye. Um, and so the, or the joke is that every year the, the hipsters say, this is the year of the lager. Um, and every year it's, it's not, it's still the IPA. So we make our, our a dry hop lager. It's four and a 4.5%. 4 it's super drinkable, um, but it has those nice aromatics uh, and flavors of hops with without the bitterness. Um, but yeah, we we know that lagers aren't the sexiest of beer style, but we really enjoy making them. They're tough to make. Um, they're super flavorful. And so we can kind of poke fun at ourselves a little bit. But no, you feel like you said, you, you, you filled a, a need in the market and helped round out a lot of people's beer portfolios. And that certainly probably made them appreciative as, as, as clients. And it's definitely, uh, seems like the, the city of Milwaukee appreciates it as you've, you know, grown over these past five, almost six years now, right? Yeah. Six years this summer. Awesome. Yeah, and there's, there really is, there, there's a lot of great beer being made in Milwaukee. Um, it seems like we all got the same idea at the same time. Um, when I started writing the business plan, there were three or maybe four breweries in the city and the, the suburbs. Um, between eight, 2016 and 2017, there were 17 breweries that opened up uh, in, in an 18 month period. And, and that covers all different corners of the city and out into the suburbs. And almost all of us are still here. And most of us are making different styles of beer and offer different experiences, but but we've certainly found a lane with these um, European inspired inspired beers. Yeah, for for as a you know, German centric as and European as a uh, city Milwaukee is, there aren't a lot of breweries that that have that focus like you do. You're right. Um, there's a lot of hazy IPAs and milkshake <laughs> IPAs, and uh, we just we took a slightly different direction. Um, another thing I, I, I found in the research I did is that I like this quote that you once said is that food is culture and, and beer is food. Um, what do you hope your beer adds to Milwaukee's culture? It's a great question. Um, 
I, I, I would circle back to what I was saying about the, the beer gardens where uh, most of the beer we make is between four and a half and six and a half percent. Um, but low alcohol doesn't have to mean low flavor. So I, I hope that what we're contributing is we're making flavorful things that are great for any occasion, whether that's meeting up with some friends or whether that's pairing with Thanksgiving dinner. You know, beer can be as elevated as wine. And I think our beer complements food very well, um, in part because it's not so strong. It's not wrecking your palate. Um, so every year in December, the our local major newspaper does their list of best 20 or 30 restaurants. And I'm always really excited because our beer is served at you know, 15 of the 25 restaurants. It, that gives me a lot of uh, gratification that these people, these chefs, whose job it is to know and evaluate flavor, they're choosing our products to pair with their food. And we know that people are going to these restaurants for what comes out of the kitchen, not what comes from the bar. But we love that our products can be there to complement their food. Let's let's talk a little bit about community again and the dollar for Milwaukee program where you're uh, you know you're contributing a portion of your of your sales to a different you know not for profit group you know every month. How did you get started with that? How do you choose the uh, the not for profits the community based organizations that you're contributing to? Well, thanks for asking about that. So my my background is in the nonprofit world. My my wife still works in the nonprofit world. So this idea of using the brewery to help support local organizations was on the cover page of the business plan from day one. And I will tell you, I, I did have one or two in, potential investors push back on that idea of uh, contributing sales, not profits. Uh, so taking it off the top rather than off the bottom. Um, but it's something we didn't waver on. And it's something that has been um, the community has really responded to. So one of the avenues that we achieve that goal of uh, contributing at least 1% of our sales to local organizations, one of the ways we do that is through our, um, our weekly One for Milwaukee program on Thursdays, where a dollar from all the beers sold at both taproom locations gets donated to a, a, a nonprofit. And we partner with one each month. So they get e each of the Thursdays in that month. So that lessens any fluctuation of maybe, and this ha actually happened last week, we had a snowstorm on a Thursday. So they're set, you know, they've got a whole month's worth. So they're not, you know, they're not out a big donation because of that snow day. Um, and it's, it's been a really great way for, for us to um, engage with different parts of our community. Uh, Milwaukee is a big city. Is about 2 million people in the metro area. It's also a very segregated city. And so there is a lot of really great work being done by local organizations, but maybe people don't know about them in the different neighbor, or different parts of the city. So part of the program is providing them financial support. Part of that program is providing a, a megaphone where they can share the work that they are doing. And, um, we are small, so our, our our contributions are small, but they're growing. And as we grow, we want the community to improve along the way. Do you, I mean how how do you wind up selecting the uh, the organizations? So we we have a form on our website where we just ask people and and we ask patrons and you know are there organizations that you like that that please su suggest them to us and please have them fill, fill out the, the form. Um, we pro The only stipulation is we don't do anything political. So no political action committees or things like that. Um, and then we, we prioritize um, Milwaukee, then Milwaukee Metro, and then Southeast Wisconsin. So uh, if it was a national organization that didn't have a footprint in Milwaukee, I wish them luck, but they wouldn't be a good fit for our program. Um, and I, I should say that, um, so there are other programs 
similar to this out there in the country. One of them that's been going on for a long time is from uh, Rubens Brews in Seattle. And I actually reached out to um, to the husband and wife who, who own Rubens Brews um, before we launched this program. And I said, hey, I really like what you're doing. We're interested in doing something similar, but a little different, but I kind of wanted to get your blessing. And, and they were super great about it. And and I think this says a lot about their character. They said, we want more breweries to be doing something like this. So yes, please go run with it. Um, and and it's it's worked well for us. And, and we've met a lot of great partners along the way. Yeah, uh, your partner for March is the Victory Garden Initiative, right? Yes. Yeah. So they, they build community gardens uh, throughout Milwaukee. And um, it's a great way to bring the different communities together around that shared purpose. And then, you know, it's also nice to have some food to eat. <laughs> Definitely always a plus that, that comes with the gardening projects. Good for the community, but also good to, you know, have some, have some, get, some get some food out of it. We have a garden right down the street from where I live, and it's always nice to uh, see the the fruits that come out of there. Not not literal fruits. Yeah, I'm off the rails. <laughs> Jesus, oh my god, it's um, it's a lot of tomatoes. By the end of the season, it's bags, yeah. of, bags of tomatoes, <laughs> <laughs> which is technically a fruit. And we're back on track there. There we um, go. Yeah, good save, Ryan. Good save. <laughs> Joe, uh, this has been a great discussion. Uh, uh, other than beer. What is one thing that you wish Milwaukee was more well known for? Um, I I don't know if I want to say anything, and, and and here's why: Milwaukee is this hidden gem. It's this great secret. And um, I used to live in Chicago, and I mentioned I lived in D.C. So I, I have a lot of friends from the East Coast who had never been to the Midwest. And they come and they visit and they they're surprised that Milwaukee is it, it looks like it's on an ocean. We're on the shores of Lake Michigan. It's very big. You can't see the other side. We have beaches. And so when our friends would come to visit, they they were very surprised that you have beaches, you have the ocean. And I just said, Jim, you're from New Jersey. Not everything revolves around New Jersey. Um, and I joke with my Chicago friends that Milwaukee has everything Chicago has except traffic and Cubs fans. And that's the way I like it. Um, so it's this place where it's super affordable. There's no traffic. It's, e it's easy to get around. So as here I am giving you a commercial for coming to visit Milwaukee, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good place. Um, and there's good breweries. There's great food, good coffee shops. And, uh, and it's also easy to get I'm I'm 90 I'm an hour from O'Hare Airport in Chicago and from there you can go anywhere in the world. So this is but I don't have to pay uh Illinois taxes. So it's it's the best of all worlds. <laughs> and you Ken might know something yeah. about that. <laughs> uh no I know a little bit about both but and you also have a damn fine basketball team and um a and a, there's just a, a a ton of great stuff going on in Milwaukee and and it, I'm afraid it may not be a hidden gem for too much longer and that that brings good and bad but it's a, it's just just a terrific place to be. Yes, we we welcome visitors and we welcome uh new residents who move here and uh, as as I'm originally from Kansas City, so I'm not native to Milwaukee. So I'm always curious why people choose to move to Milwaukee, and um, it's usually some form of of those things that I mentioned. And so it, it's it's fun to be in a city where there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of growth, and there's good things happening. Well, that's awesome, Joe. Thank you so much for joining us. Where can people find Gathering Place Beer? Uh, well, thanks so much for having me. This has been really fun. Um, unfortunately, given our size, Gathering Place Beer is found just in Wisconsin. Um, but we distribute uh, widely throughout Southeast Wisconsin from the border with Illinois up to Green Bay and then west to uh, Madison. So most major grocery chains, you can find our beer um, as well as our two tap rooms in Wauwatosa and in Milwaukee. Look, own own that fact that you're only available in Wisconsin. Look, New Glarus <laughs> and Gathering Place, only available in Wisconsin. 
Yes, and maybe those are the only two things we have in common. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I love and respect those guys. I, I wish we were, we are we are on a different growth path. I'll say that, but they make good stuff. They're 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 a special brewery, but you know, don't sell yourself too short. These these beers are phenomenal examples of old world styles done with new world twists. And I think I think the people at New Glarus would would respect that as as we have. Uh, Ken and I certainly have the respect for it, and, and it's been great to to feature the beers and, and the brewery and, and talk to you uh, tonight. So, um, yeah. Well, thanks again for having me, and I hope everyone's enjoying the beers. Thank you. I'm sure they are, Joe. Thanks so much. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight. Uh, if you want to follow uh, along with Gathering Place as they grow in the Milwaukee area, you can follow them on Instagram at Gathering Place Brewing. Uh, you can follow us on uh, on Instagram at Bruvana. Thanks again to Gathering Place for supp- supplying the beers for tonight's episode, as well as our beer club. As always, you can head over to Bruvana.com and check out subscription options to join the beer club and get great beers like these shipped directly to you on a monthly basis. We'll be back next week with our next episode featuring milwaukee we're going to talk about raised grain brewing company and all the awesome things that they do drink two really great styles and uh do more of of this awesome beer drinking and beer talking ken it's been great brian Uh, great great as always uh happy pie day uh and uh, and uh we will uh we will talk to you next week Yes, everybody, stay safe, be kind, and uh, support your local breweries. Cheers. Cheers. Woo. Thanks for watching Brews Less Traveled on YouTube. Be sure to uh, like this video and subscribe to our channel for more interviews with brewery professionals.